Please, put your glasses down, put your hands together. Welcome to the stage, Giles Brandron. Yay! Yay! Thank you so much, Des. Oh, is that marvellous. Des very sweetly said to me when we were in the back there before I came up, his last words were to me, knock him dead. I wasn't sure that was entirely appropriate. <laughs> but I'm so happy to be here, so excited to be here, and, and I'm wearing, as you see, my new rain, new jumper. Uh, thank you. I've been wearing colorful knitwear for half a century and more. Uh, and, uh, but when I became, I was a member of parliament for a while, not, not very long. I was a member of parliament, in fact, until the people spoke. <laughs> the bastards. <laughs> I, I only served one term. And uh, by the time the time came round that I lost my seat, by then I, I knew I was going to lose my seat. By, by then I knew, of course, I had contempt for my constituents. Um, <laughs> but it came as a bit of a shock to the system to find the feeling was entirely mutual. <laughs> and it didn't help that my darling wife put our house in the constituency up for sale during the election campaign. <laughs> uh, on every other house in the street, it said, vote Brandreth, vote Brandreth, vote Brandreth. On our house, it said, for sale. <laughs> but while I was an MP, I didn't wear the jumpers. I, I turned up in a regulation suit. Uh, but almost the first time I chose to speak in the House of Commons, who should be sitting on the opposition front bench but John Prescott? Uh, and some of you are old enough to know who I mean. <laughs> he is still alive now since Covid, known as Two Jabs Prescott. Uh, <laughs> but a good man. Uh, except on that occasion, he didn't seem to me to be a good man because he clocked me. He realised that I was the person who used to wear the colour of Oh, the sound is coming and going. Uh, but that doesn't matter. Uh, we're used to it coming and going, aren't we? Uh, which is as it should be. Uh, on our television set, we can't make the sound consistent at all. We can't make the pictures consistent at all. We have to keep getting the uh, subtitles up to understand what's going on. Uh, we're trying to get them down now, but the relevant grandchild is not available. Uh, is it coming and going too much for your liking? It's okay. It just seems to be coming and going to me. Uh, well, I was there making my speech, and there was John Prescott barracking me, going, Woolly jump up. Woolly jumper, I struggled on with my speech, and he carried on with his barracking, realizing that he'd discomforted me, going, Woolly jumper, woolly jumper. Well, eventually I had to pause and point out to Mr. Prescott that the joy of a woolly jumper is that you can take it off at will. Whereas the. Go to a special school near Woking where they learn to actually turn down the sound just as you're reaching the punchline. I, and the young man is coming up to the stage with a new set of micro, because this is going to be irritating. To, and feel free to show how young and sprightly you are by nipping this way. <laughs> I've got to be careful what you do nowadays. He looks old enough. But if I was trying to encourage him to come up too quickly, later in the day I would get a letter telling me that I'd been bullying him. Uh, are you coming with a second sunset? You are. Well done. And it's an amusing maze, this. This is an amusing idea. He's trying to find his way to the front. Well done. This is a good idea. If you, actually, well done you. What, what, are we, what, are we, what are you replacing? <laughs> this is as near as some of us get to excitement. No, no. <laughs> That's coming off. Uh, just, just hold that. I haven't heard that line for a while. Madam, it's not part of the act. Oh, you're sorry, I'm looking in here. How are we doing? Don't worry, we've got all the time in the world. These people are only here because they have nowhere better to go. <laughs> okay, are we, are we on? Well done. Well done, thank you. Thank you. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. We're in the House of Commons. John Prescott is on the opposition front bench barracking me, and I'm about to say to him, 
What am I about to say to him? I'm about to say to him, yes, the trouble, yeah, the joy of a woolly jumper, the joy of a woolly jumper is that you can take it off at will, whereas the blight of a woolly mind is that you're lumbered with it for life. <laughs> but the point of the story is, the point of the story is that he got the last, the point of the story, <laughs> the joy of this sort of thing is the first seven minutes are quite amusing, but 40 minutes later, the novelty will have worn off. Are we hoping it's going to work now? Yeah, do you think it is going to work now? If not, we'll do a handheld. Oh, what was that at that time? He's coming back. What is your name? Because I think we need to know your name. Uh, because we're clearly going to get you know you better and better as the afternoon wears on. That's okay. Did you have this sort of problem with Izzy? No, I bet you didn't. Okay, you, oh, she did a handheld. Yeah, wow. Well. <laughs> Let's not go there. Let's got no there. We're in enough trouble already. We'll give this one more go, and then we'll revert to the handheld as well. All right. Uh, so, where were we? I was telling you how pleased I am to be here, but the John Prescott got the last laugh because he ended up in the House of Lords, is now wrapped in ermine, whereas I, I am here. <laughs> with my friend, who is... Uh, this is a lot better, is it? I, I'm, I'm pleased you've met my, my, my friend because at the end, he's giving the next talk, which is to uh, recommend to all of you his hearing aid. Um, <laughs> it's not totally reliable. It comes and goes. Um, <laughs> but he'll pop around to try and fix it for you personally. I'm delighted to be here. This is a cur oh God. This is a curious gathering agenda. But here we are, people of riper years, talking about the joys of being of riper years. From my point of view, there are some, uh, some advantages to being older, not that many. Uh, I now get mainly what I would call old codger's work. I, I sit by my telephone. I still have a landline. Do we, people in this room, you probably know what a landline is. Yay! Well, uh, I wouldn't be too proud of it. Um, a lot of people don't know what a landline is. I have a landline. I have a landline attached to a telephone that is an old-fashioned proper telephone with a thing you lift off the top, uh, avocado color uh, it, to match the B-Day. Uh, and I sit... I, I, shall we go for a handheld and see if that... Yeah, let's go for a handheld. There we are. It, it comes to this. Well, that, never mind. What, 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 what was your name? Graham. Yeah, it's not, it's not necessarily his. It's not necessarily... It's very sweet that the lady in the front here is saying it's part of the act. It has become part of the act. It wasn't <laughs> meant to be part of the act, madam. This probably is better. Okay. So let's, let's stick. Yes, absolutely. Come to the Hurlingham Club to get the clap. That's also on the billing. All right. I think we could start all over again. A telephone. I do have a telephone that's a landline. I've kept it. I mean, I don't need it anymore because nobody calls on it. I kept it because my mother used to use it. Barry Cryer used to use it. Nicholas Parsons used to use it. Now, now nobody uses it, but I still keep it. And I sit there waiting, you know, for the people from Love Island to get in touch. <laughs> Nothing comes. But I do on my cell phone occasionally get people communicating. And this week, in fact, I've been offered another television series for old codgers. This is going to involve, it, it's called, it's for old codgers, it's a travel show. And it's a group of old codgers going on holiday. And the show is entitled, it's for Channel 5, The Real Marigold B&B &B in Prestatin. <laughs> it is going to involve me and a group of other old folk going on a hiking and biking holiday to North Wales. And because it's Channel 5, they've got to sex it up a bit and make it more entertaining. We're not just going as a group. No, we've been divided into pairs. And I have been chosen. I've been partnered up with my old university and uh, parliamentary friend. I will be teamed up with, you know, sharing my tent with, zipping up my sleeping bag with, yes, you guessed it, who have they given me as my companion? Anne Whittacombe. <laughs> Uh, 
I, I'm very fond of Anne Widdicombe. I know her well. I know there's a lady here from the New York Times who may not know who I mean. Difficult to describe Anne Widdicombe to a stranger. Uh, Anne Widdicombe, really, a sort of curious cross between Danny DeVito and Margaret Rutherford. <laughs> but that's the sort of work that you get. Well, I, actually, it's not entirely fair. I have been asked to be on a series called Celebrity Gogglebox, which is great fun. Uh, and you watch television, and you're filmed watching television. That's, that's the essence of the show. And I've done it with a variety of distinguished people, each one of whom, incidentally, has become a dame since doing Gogglebox with me. Uh, and I, my, my wife says, it was all happened, the, the people, I first did it with uh, Sheila Hancock, she became a dame, then did it with Maureen Lippmann, she became a dame, Joanna Lumley, she became a dame, all during the last reign. And my wife came to the conclusion it was because Her Majesty watched uh, Gogglebox herself and thought what these poor women have to put up with uh, <laughs> sitting next to him but it was quite an experience because um, Sheila Hancock who I really love a most remarkable uh, person she is 90 she is so full of life energy anger um, she's just so remarkable a really remarkable human being and we did this during lockdown we were in this bubble we made a bubble for ourselves and we sat there being filmed for this program a goggle box, the pair of us on the sofa, and I thought, how strange this is, that here I am sitting with a 90-year-old lady, and the pair of us are getting hooked on something called naked attraction. <laughs> this is what the world has come to. And then suddenly, I, suddenly I, I turned to uh, Sheila, and I realized this lady, aged 90, was trying to explain to me what a fanny flutter is. <laughs> strange world that we now live in. But there are advantages to growing older, but there are commercial advantages. You know, this is a fair where uh, a lot of the people are selling things to, to older people. And I have been offered commercial opportunities for older people. Uh, I was asked some years ago to be the new face of the Stanner Stairlift. Um, <laughs> when June Whitfield died, I was invited to be the new body on the floor reaching out for the alarm. I actually went to an audition for this. <laughs> the money was so great, I went to the audition. It's humbling, isn't it? Humiliating, actually. I went and I, I reached, I thought I was doing it really well. Anyway, I went to the audition. I wasn't paid expenses. I just went to the audition and I did not get the gig. <laughs> I'd been offered selling gold coins. Um, I, I'd been asked to do uh, selling funeral plans. Uh, uh, instead of Michael Parkinson, because he's looking a bit peaky. And um, that's awful. When, they, when, when somebody's got a gig like that, and they phone you, and you say, but, oh, isn't he doing it already? And they say, well, we... Uh, anyway. Uh, uh, but I, you can, at the moment, hear me. I'm the voice of a commercial on ITV3. This is the channel where they show old murder mysteries again endlessly of an afternoon and I am the voice of one of the most popular of the commercials on ITV3 of an afternoon. I am now the voice of the Tenor Flex Plus Super Soft Incontinence Pad. <laughs> Apparently my dulcet tones are exactly what this product requires. Smooth, emollient, absorbent. <laughs> now, I, I, I'm billed this afternoon to talk to you about how to be happy, or how to, how to live to be 100 and be happy, or be happy at 100. It can be done. And I do believe that it can be done. And uh, I'm just going to check the, the time, because uh, it doesn't bother me how long we go on for. Uh, as you can imagine, because uh, even if I overrun, you may all need to go away for a comfort break, but I can stand here uh, for as long as it takes, thanks to the Tenor Flex Plus <laughs> Super Soft Incontinence Pad. I shall probably boast to you all by drinking several pints of water <laughs> on stage. Uh, and, and the people who employ me, they say, if you manage to get through eight pints, we're all supposed to drink eight pints a day, you know, on stage without leaving, we get a bonus. So you may find that I do drink rather more than I would normally in the hope of picking up the bonus from these people. 
I am seriously interested in happiness. And I became interested in happiness when I lost my seat as a member of parliament. It was a bad year for me. I, I, they say you shouldn't take being rejected as an MP personally, but you do. Um, I mean, it was a great swing against everybody in the year that I lost my seat. But nonetheless, I took it personally. And it hadn't been a good year. My father had died. Well, he was of an age. But my sister died the same year. And I had three sisters, and one sister died that year. My brother, who was younger than me, also died that year. And my best friend from school, some of you may remember him, an actor called Simon Cadell died that year. So it was a bad year for me. All these, my father, my sister, my brother, my best friend, all dying. My, my darling wife, of course, she just soldiered on. Anyway. Uh, it was a tough year. And I thought, actually, I'm generally a happy person. And why do I feel a bit glum? Why do I feel a bit grim? And I thought, well, I can do something about this. And I, I was listening to the radio on a Sunday morning. And I heard a program with a wonderful man called Dr. Anthony Clare. I wonder if that name rings a bell with any of you. He was then doing a program called In the Psychiatrist's Chair. And I thought, this is a really wise-sounding person. I love the warmth of his voice. I thought, look, go to the top. Go to get the best. So I made inquiries about where he was based as a psychiatrist. And I found it was in Dublin, where he was the head of the uh, mental hospital in Dublin. And I booked a flight, went out, made an appointment, went to see Professor Anthony Clare. And I went into his room, and I said, I'm looking for the elixir of happiness. He said, well, if it's an elixir you're after, Dublin's not a bad place to start. <laughs> And I sat down in the psychiatrist's chair with this remarkable individual. And as happens when you sit in the psychiatrist's chair, the psychiatrist often begins talking to you about your parents. And because my father had just died, I was very conscious of my father. We began by talking about my father and indeed my mother. And the first thing I asked Dr. Clare is this. I said to him, why, Dr. Clare, did my parents often talk about the Second World War? as the happiest time of their lives. Because my father, during the Second World War, he was in the army for six years. He was risking his life. Um, and you know, my mother, during the Second World War, she lived in a flat in London with my older sisters, who were little babies then. But bombs were falling. And yet both my parents, when they talked about those years, not often, but when they did, they clearly reflected on them as some of the happiest years of their life. And I said, why, why is that? And he said, oh, that's very easy to explain. I said, tell me. He said, well, your mother, yes, bombs were falling on London at that time. But also in London, there was a sense of community, a sense of common purpose, of shared values, a sense of fellowship, of community spirit. And that makes people very happy indeed. And your father, yes, for six years in the army, he was indeed risking his life. The soldiers, the sailors, the airmen throughout the Second World War, risking their lives on a daily basis. But also on a daily basis, they were being tested. He said, and all the research shows that being tested is a key element to finding happiness. He said, you very rarely find people sitting around not doing very much who are happy. An engagement with life, being tested, being challenged is one of the key elements to being happy. I thought, this is very intriguing. There's more to this than I realized. So I began talking more to him about the sort of people who are happy in life. Because I had already discovered through my research that people who are happy, who report themselves as being happy, live from seven to ten years longer than people who are unhappy. So this little talk this afternoon won't just enhance your lives, it could extend your lives, which is why I'm so grateful that we can now hear it. Um, so I said, well, what sort of people, are there some people more predisposed to happiness than others? Do beautiful people get to be happier than plain people? He said, oh no, quite the reverse, in fact. He said, it's quite interesting. Human beings find extremes of any kind quite difficult to cope with. So that somebody who is exceptionally beautiful, for example, may find forming a, a proper relationship quite difficult. Marilyn Monroe, incredibly beautiful, but found relationships very difficult. Uh, people who are more homely looking are more likely to be happy than people who are very beautiful, which I must say is good news for this crowd. Uh, <laughs> I, 
I asked about people with disabilities, and this was intriguing. He said, no. He said, there's no evidence that people with disabilities, physical or mental disabilities, have a uh, report being happy more or less than people without those disabilities. Um, he said, people tend to be happier if they have a philosophy of life. People with faith tend to be happier than people without faith. It doesn't need to be a religious faith, but a line of life, a, a string, a sort of purpose in life. That seems to make people happy. I said, what about being married or not being married? He said, ah. He said, there is some interesting research here. He said, people who are cohabiting will be happier than people who are not cohabiting, but people who are married are likely to be happier than people who are simply cohabiting. I said, and he said, marginally within marriages, uh, the men are happier than the women, marginally. I said, what happens when somebody dies? He said, oh, he said this is very interesting research. With a, with a married couple, when the uh, wife dies, the surviving husband, within three years, he will either have found a new partner or he will be dead. <laughs> within three years. Within three years. Um, the, the wife dies, within three years, the man has either found a new partner, remarried, or he is dead himself. And I said, when it's the other way around, when, when the, the, the man dies, and the woman, he said, that's even more interesting. When the man dies, for the woman who remains, after three years, it makes no difference whatsoever. <laughs> <laughs> So we became friends, Anthony Clare and I, and between us we evolved, I suppose, what you could call the seven secrets of happiness. And eventually I produced a little book called The Seven Secrets of Happiness, which touches on some of this. In fact, over the years, I think there are probably about 10 secrets to happiness. But the key ones that I'm going to share with you now are ones that you can't just pick and choose. It's not a pick and mix. It's not a game where you can say, I have a bit of that and a bit of that. You've actually got to follow all the rules if you want to be happy. And remember, if you are happy, you will live seven to ten years longer than if you are unhappy. But the backdrop to this is thinking about my parents and remembering that a sense of community and being challenged, being tested, are two key elements to finding happiness. Sitting around not doing very much, on the whole, doesn't seem to make people very happy at all. So, the first of the seven secrets, if I get through them, I'd, I'll try at least to do five. The first of the secrets is this. Be a leaf on a tree. Now, what does that mean, to be a leaf on a tree? Well, we are all. I mean, every leaf on every tree in the world is individual, unique, like all of us are unique. We're all individuals. And every leaf on every tree in the world is unique. Uh, but off the tree... It floats about a bit, it feels free, and that's quite exciting. But quite quickly, it floats to the ground and it dies. We need to be a leaf on a tree, attached to an organism that is larger than ourselves and still growing. That's the important element. And it can be anything. It can, it can be a golf club, it can be a choir, it can be a place of work. It can be, actually, an old folks' home. But there's got to be a sense of community. It's got to be part and parcel of something that is alive and still growing. Be a leaf on a tree. The second one, cultivate a passion, something that you really love doing, preferably something beyond your work. This, for somebody like me, is a bit of a challenge because uh, I, I like working and I work all the time. Uh, I believe with Noel Card that work on the whole is more fun than fun. Um, but sometimes having your work as the mainstay of your life is difficult if you cease to have that work. And, for example, I give the example, I would say, of Margaret Thatcher. I was lucky enough to know Margaret Thatcher, whatever your politics may be. She was a remarkable individual, our first woman prime minister, uh, and a person of great strength and integrity. Uh, no sense of humor. That was the only downside with Mrs. Thatcher. No sense of humor. I always felt that must have made bringing up Mark quite challenging. But Margaret Thatcher, born, I think, in about 1926. Now, my wife and I got to know Mrs. Thatcher quite well, particularly towards the end of her life. And she was quite a sad person towards the end of her life, particularly after her husband, Dennis, died. And that was because the real passion of her life was politics. She was driven by politics, is what she loved. And when that passion was denied her, when she ceased to be prime minister, she didn't have other resources to fall back on. Politics to her was everything. And she died quite, quite a sad 
person towards the end of her life. Now, Mrs. Thatcher was born in the same year as our late queen, Elizabeth II, who lived, as you know, to be 96 years of age and was still on duty doing her thing two days before she died. A most remarkable human being. And as you know, the queen was driven by duty, sustained by faith, but made happy by the passion of her life, her dogs and her horses. Well, that's really what kept her going. There's no question of it. The Queen was undoubtedly, and I, and I wrote, I've written a biography of the Queen and was lucky enough to spend quite a bit of time with her, most fascinating human being, a most remarkable and impressive human being. But she was undoubtedly a happy person. And I believe she was a happy person because she did have the work, she did have the faith, and she did have the passion. The dogs and her... Madam, do you want to say something? And a nice husband. Yes, indeed. Uh, that, that, do, that does help. But uh, also having a huge house so that he can live at one end and you can live at the other. Um, but the truth is that when her husband died, uh, one of the things that indeed kept the Queen going was the fact she did have her work. Uh, and she, uh, for example, Queen Victoria when she was, of course, much younger, when her husband died, Queen Victoria gave way to grief and uh, became a very sad person. She dressed herself in mourning for the rest of her life, became a recluse to the, such the extent that the people, the government of the day, was anxious uh, that she was not delivering on her duty. The Queen took the reverse attitude and quite quickly after the death of her husband, uh, and their relationship was wonderful, Really wonderful. The Duke of Edinburgh once, when I, I did a biography of him, we were talking, he, he didn't want to talk about relationships, that wasn't his thing for a moment, but he did point me towards a quotation by Antoine de Saint-Exupéry, the uh, aviator and writer of the, or the book The Little Prince, where Saint-Exupéry says, love consists not necessarily in gazing into one another's eyes, but in looking in the same direction. The Queen and Prince Philip had a common purpose. They walked in tandem, two very different people. But the point uh, of the, uh, the story is that the Queen deliberately wore colorful clothes. She deliberately got back to doing her duty as soon as she could after his death. She wanted to go back to the races. She kept on feeding her dogs. That, for her, kept her going. And indeed, two days before she died, um, as well as uh, saying goodbye to one prime minister, uh, welcoming another prime minister, and indeed signing off the order of merit for Fluella Benjamin, she also, um, whose book she was reading at the time that she died. And the reason I think that she wanted to honor Fluella Benjamin and uh, give her the order of merit was that she read her autobiography and loved it because she felt that here was somebody who had come to this country with her parents in the 1950s, where they had felt they had faced some not very pleasant welcome from a lot of local people, but had coped with it without rancor. And the Queen very much respected people who lived through life without rancor. But having done those duties, there was a two o'clock race somewhere, and her horse won. Um, oh, you know, what a way to go if you've lived that sort of a life. Indeed, as the Duke of Edinburgh once said to me in relation to the Queen, if it doesn't fart or eat hay, she is not interested. <laughs> but the point is, cultivate a passion. Have something in life that you love doing that sustains you. A couple more. Don't resist change. This is the one that I find quite difficult because people, if you're like me, I do resist change. I don't like change. I don't like the 21st century. I, I don't, I mean, I want to live in the 1880s, 1890s, have enough money to do so comfortably. That's my idea of an ideal time. Um, I, I mean, I do not want to, I, the, I, I do not wish to learn another password. I just simply don't. Uh, the seven most revolting words in the English language are Good news, we have improved the app. I didn't know what the app was to begin with. I certainly don't need it improved overnight at midnight. The phone works one day, the next day it's been so improved I can't even get into it. The whole thing is a nightmare. I don't want any of that. You know, I'm putting down my shopping in Tesco, unidentified object in bagging area, and I... Fuck off! 
But I am wrong. I am wrong, ladies and gentlemen. We need to embrace change. As Dr. Clare pointed out to me, change is the salt in the soup of life. People say, don't rock the boat. But in fact, a little gentle rocking does you good. So that's the one I find most challenging. The one young people find most challenging is the next one, which is break the mirror. Stop thinking about yourself. Just break the... We've all turned our lives into one long selfie. Ah, it's all about me, 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 you know, and, and, and my mental well-being. Stop thinking about your mental well-being. It might improve. Um, stop looking in the mirror. Stop thinking about yourself. Nobody is interested. The Duke of Edinburgh, who lived to 99, Duke of Edinburgh told his children, and I don't know if he told his grandchildren, but he certainly told his children, um, uh, don't talk about yourself. Nobody's interested. People are interested in themselves, not just in you. Don't talk about yourself. Just don't do it. And his children took that seriously. Uh, that's the reason that I, I know that he would have um, he hugely admired and loved his grandson, Harry, but would certainly have regretted the idea of him doing a television interview with somebody like Oprah Winfrey and then writing a book. Don't talk about yourself. It does, it does no good. Brooding about yourself just does no good. And sharing it with other people, if you're in this position, just don't do it. Um, but young people find this one very difficult. Break the mirror. Don't think about yourself. Um, change is the one people, I think, of our vintage find difficult. Don't think about yourself. We find easier because we've lost interest. Um, <laughs> <laughs> that is the truth of the matter, isn't it? I'll just give you a couple more, um, because I, I've been told I ought to allow you an opportunity to ask a question or two. Um, the, the one is audit your happiness. Audit your happiness, what does this mean? Actually, this means being practical, being pragmatic. Make a list, if you're, if you're not happy, if you think the things that don't make you happy, make a list of all the things you like doing most and a separate list of all the things you like doing least. And try this year to lengthen the list of things you like doing and shorten the list of things you don't like doing. So if there are things you really don't like doing, you know, babysitting for the grandchildren. Just, um, uh, I'm, not, I'm not suggesting that would be one of the things, uh, but whatever it is, actually make the list and make one list longer than the other. That's a good thing to do. So the next one that I will mention, actually, is a nice one, uh, and that is count your blessings. I, I find this is a very good thing to do in the evening if you are trying to get to sleep. Uh, actually, I have no difficulty getting to sleep. I do wake, though, at about five in the morning and uh, find get, going back to sleep then quite difficult. And I do a couple of things. I, I play alphabetical games. I'm doing uh, playwrights at the moment, uh, international playwrights from A to Z. And I try to make them sort of obscure, you know, nothing easy like Alan Akeborn. I'm Jean Anouy, um, Samuel Beckett, Paul Claudel, uh, um, Friedrich Dürrenmatt, uh, and then reduced to T.S. Eliot. Um, but anyway, that, that's the idea. And long before you get down to Benjamin Zephaniah and hope that he did write a play, uh, you've nodded off. <laughs> but the one I enjoy doing better is Count Your Blessings. And that is a very nice way to get to sleep. But also, it's a way of reminding yourself, actually, how many blessings you have. And the blessings you count can be simple ones. And um, I try to include in my list of blessings every day something that I have been in awe of that day. And when I say being in awe of, that can be going to an art gallery. I went this weekend, I was lucky enough to be at Chichester this weekend, and I went to an art gallery there and saw some paintings by Gwen John. And they were, one of them was so wonderful, I stood in front of it, and I thought, oh, this is my, I'm in awe of this today. And so I counted it my blessings last night. But uh, uh, at home, we have a small garden, and there were some flowers from the garden that uh, the uh, very nice person who helps with the cleaning at home, who's a brilliant flower arranger, Marta, she'd put them in a vase. And they looked so wonderful, these flowers in the vase. I thought, oh, I, in fact, I will tweet the picture later so that you can see it. Those of you who do Twitter um, can, can, you know, because you do need to have a passion in your life. It could be Twitter. Um, uh, you can see the picture of the flowers. I was in awe. Of, so it can be little things, um, you know, when you come off the diet and decide you're going to have real butter again because you're 87 and uh, what the hell, um, you know. 
butter on toast, too much butter on toast that has actually been cooked a little bit too much with just the, an under amount of the raspberry jam. I'm ready to be in awe of that any day. So I include that in my list of things to be in awe of. The point of what I'm telling you is this. Combine all these secrets and you will live longer and be happier. Before I give you my, my last secret, since I've been asked to throw this open to the floor, if anybody, do not go to them with the roving mic, uh, Graham. It's a nice idea, but stay where you are. Uh, if you have a question to ask, feel free to ask it, um, or I will proceed. If you have some, uh, something would lead the conversation in a new way, anyone got something they want to ask me uh, of any kind um, before I go on to the last secret? Yes. Ah, where can we get my jumper? Thank you. Very good. What is your name, madam? Hazel. Hazel. I, I'd already I'd clocked you earlier, and I had the answer to what I hoped was going to be your question already on the edge of my mouth, uh, which was 0772416415. You, you obviously you live at Hurlingham Club, do you? Or, or you just thought, well, why not wear the onesie on the underground to get there? Yes. She looks charming, just charming. Just a bit of banter. Um, where do you get the jumpers? Uh, I love the jumpers. This is a one-off jumper, uh, unique. Uh, there isn't another one, and um, that, that's it. A uh, lady called Susie Johns designed it. Um, well, the person who designed the King's Cipher designed it, but she created it, which is marvellous. Uh, I think you are what you wear, and having been silly about your very nice outfit, uh, can I say congratulations to the people who actually thought, hmm, like the lady who's come wearing a fun hat. Uh, it's a lovely thing to do. Uh, yeah, why not? Uh, when, when I was very young, 50, 60 years ago, I used to talk at ladies' luncheon clubs when they existed, and the ladies all turned up wearing wonderful hats. And it was a fun thing to do. And they said, it finishes the outfit. It's a fun thing to do. So you are what you air. Um, I, you can get my jumpers. Uh, and I've been wearing those jumpers for more than 40 years. Um, from a, uh, You go to something called Giles and George, uh, dot com, gilesandgeorge.com. And um, if you're downsizing, you could afford to buy one. Um, <laughs> I can't decide about the downsizing. My wife's quite keen on the downsizing. I'm not. Um, but there you go. So, yes. Anything else? Anyone? Yes. What is my passion? Yeah. What is my real... Well, if, if I'm being honest with you, language is my passion. I love words. Words, to me, are what music is to many other people. I love words. I love, I love poetry. Learning poetry by heart is a very good way of helping to keep dementia at bay. I did some research on this a few years ago before producing a book called Dancing by the Light of the Moon. Some of you may have been to the most delightful talk given by two young men, one of whom is the grandson of Dame Judi Dench. And Dame Judi Dench, uh, who I'm lucky enough to know and do a, a show with, in fact, I'm going to be doing it next on the 11th of June at Hampton Court Palace in the evening. Do come along. It's for the Queen's Reading Room, a wonderful charity that the Queen has started in which Dame Judy and I are involved. But I remember interviewing Dame Judy about words and language because she loves Shakespeare particularly. You were with her this morning. Well, oh, of course you were. Uh, the Chelsea Flower Show, of course. You both have roses named after you, I imagine. As it should be. Well, that, uh, uh, um, yeah. Uh, it's very funny, you know, the dahlia is called the dahlia, even though the man was called Dahl. Anyway, that's neither I, neither here nor there. Uh, but Dame Judy Dench, I said, what's the first poem you learned as a little girl? Because not much of the poetry we slam in our heads is what we learned when we were small children. And she said, it would be Shakespeare. I said, no, 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 when you were a very small girl, you know, the nursery. She said, no, it would be Shakespeare. I said, I find this very hard to believe. She said, yes, I definitely, the first things I learned were Shakespeare. And I went to see the head of memory at Cambridge University, who explained to me that that's quite possible. She said, yes, it is quite possible. She went and understood it. But she could well have learnt Shakespeare very young. Because you know the iambic pentameter that Shakespeare is writing in? The iambic pentameter is the same rhythm as the beat of your heart. That's why it's called learning by heart. That is the rhythm, the iambic pentameter. So it's quite possible to have learnt Shakespeare at a very young age. 
And the point is, though, uh, speaking poetry to children before they are born, and indeed in their early years, will help them with their language skills, help them to uh, speak better, to read better, and to write better. Lots of research on this. But equally interesting, perhaps more interesting to this crowd, is that learning poetry when you are an older person keeps the synapses supple. Um, you know, if you don't use it, you lose it. Uh, and so the challenge of learning poetry is a very great one. Uh, people say, oh, I, I don't think I can. Well, the way to start, I think, is to relearn poems that you knew when you were at school, when you were a child. And all of us have got in the rattlebag of our minds poetry that we remember from childhood. And that's good poetry to, to bring to life again. Uh, but it isn't that difficult to learn poetry. Uh, in, in my book, Dancing by the Light of the Moon, which is an anthology of poems to learn by heart, there's quite a lot on this science of memory and how it actually works. But if you can learn two lines, and almost all of us can learn two lines uh, on a day, you can remember two lines, just choose two lines of a poem and then repeat them when you go to bed. In the shower, if you take a shower, in the bath, you take a bath. Um, you learn, well, obviously not when you're trying to get out of the bath because you've got to concentrate on that. Um, but uh, if you're taking a shower, while you're in the shower, just repeat the two lines over and over again. And they will clog, lock in your memory. Having learned two lines, well, I'll give you an example. Uh, my favorite limerick goes like this. There was a young man from Peru. In fact, you can repeat this after me, uh, Judy's friend. Yes. Uh, See, she's learned that line already. There was a young man from Peru whose limericks stopped at line two. See, that's the whole poem, and you've learned it. <laughs> but the point is, all of you, all of you, I guarantee, on the bus, the underground, or the limousine taking you home after this, will be able to remember there was a young man from Peru whose limerick stopped at line two. It's amusing. It's something to tell the grandchildren. Uh, and it's funny. But the point is, you have learnt it. You have learnt it instantly. It's there. Now, in the same way, you can take two lines, the first two lines of a Shakespeare sonnet, and you could learn them tonight. And they'll be in there. And then tomorrow night, you can learn another two lines. And within seven days, within a week, you have learnt a complete Shakespeare sonnet. How satisfying is that? And that is the point. It's stimulating. It's challenging. For me, it's a passion. But you'll have a different passion. Gardening must be your passion. Whatever your passion is, pursue that passion. And do it where you can with other people. I mean, I like speaking poetry by heart. There are groups where people get together, read poetry. But you may want to be, belong to a gardening club. You may want to sing in a choir. Be a leaf on a tree, cultivate a passion, do something you haven't done before, resist, don't resist change, uh, break the mirror, stop talking about yourself, phone your daughter up and don't talk about yourself. They're, can I say, they're not interested in you. Do not think your children are interested in you. They are when the day comes for signing the power of attorney, there's something in it for them. <laughs> but otherwise they are not interested in you. I mean, they, no, they really went, oh, yes, they, you'll, get a, you'll get a card on your birthday, but it's only if your daughter-in-law remembers. <laughs> Fundamentally, they are not interested. Nobody is interested in you. So, but I have to say, learning poetry by heart is a lovely one. I'll give you, before I, before I go away, and I, oh, oh God, have, have I run, oh, yes, I have run out of time. So I, I've run out of time, so I, I'm going to end with one short poem. And thank you very much for your company this afternoon. Uh, as I said, there is this little book called The Seven Secrets of Happiness, but even more, I recommend The Book of Poetry, because it's full of wonderful poems to learn by heart, Dancing by the Light of the Moon. And I've also written this biography of the Queen, Elizabeth I. So it's called Elizabeth and Intimate, Elizabeth and, and Intimate, and, and Elizabeth II. Yeah, a you bought it. Thank you so much. That's very sweet of you. And you bought my other books too. Well, I'll come and spend. Some, I'll come and spend some time with you in a moment. Yeah, yeah, that'd be lovely. But, but the reason I recommend the book about the Queen, Elizabeth, an intimate portrait, is that actually, if you look at the life of the Queen, who lived to be ninety-six, which is a good age, and indeed her husband lived to be ninety-nine, it's because they, in their lives, lived these secrets I've been sharing with you. And that is how you can keep on going. Of course, 
there will be physical ailments. And of course, when you get to the end of the road, there will be death waiting for you. But I'm not against death for this reason. I have now for 22 years been the host every year of the British Funeral Directors Awards. <laughs> A marvelous event uh, that takes place annually here. They don't tell you much about this. There's a trade fair where they show off all the new caskets. Uh, and then in the evening there's an awards ceremony. I stand on the stage here and I give out the prizes. And normally at an awards ceremony, when you've won a prize, you come up onto the stage, you get it, you go back to your place. Not at the funeral directors, oh no. There you get given your prize and you take your prize and you're expected to back slowly to the rear of the stage where the curtains part and you disappear behind them. <laughs> And there are two big prizes at the end of the evening. One is for the crematorium of the year, known as the Creme de la Creme Award. And the other is the Lifetime Achievement Award for thinking outside the box. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen. I'm going to end with four lines of poetry. What a lovely crowd you've been. I congratulate the agenda people on making this happen. As a kindness to them, before you go, do waft around the stalls pretending to look interested, OK? Uh, it's, it's a fun event. It's good to get out. Uh, but remember what we need in life are basically laughter and friendship. Four lines by Hilaire Belloc. From quiet homes and first beginning, out to the undiscovered ends, there's nothing worth the wear of winning but laughter and the love of friends. Thank you for your laughter, and I hope there's friendship in your lives.